Hello, my name is Nicole, and thank you so much for taking the time out to listen. Today, we are talking about going to war, going to war. Those of you all who have been studying the Bible, as well as those who have been attending church and those who have been doing both. At some point, you may have been talked to by a minister, a deacon, a sister in Christ, or even God himself about keeping the passion, the fire for one true God. They may have told you that you don't want your lamp to go out like those women who did just that while the others were wise and made sure that their lamps were filled. That, of course, is in the Bible for those who are unfamiliar with the story. You may have been encouraged to keep praying, even though at times you didn't want to keep praying about a situation. There have been those individuals who may have told you to fast. And for some of you all, you did just that, whether you fasted from food, from drink, from going to different places or spending money, you we're on some kind of fast where you gave up what you like to do for a period of time. But now the season of war is coming upon some individuals. It's a season that will be trying, a season that will test you emotionally, physically. For some of you all, even sexually, because you have been fasting from the opposite sex For others, the same sex. I don't want to live that sort of life any longer. I want to zero in on what it is that God intends for me to do. Someone said. And so when you give up things and when you are doing the types of things that are leading you toward the one true God. What's happening is that sooner or later, there's a war right around the corner. It may be a war that is verbal with a family member or friends that you thought had your back. It might be a war where you go into a public setting and there is someone in the crowd who wants to say a thing or two to hurt your feelings or to take something away from you or to have you wait for something for a long, long time because they're offended by you. There's that spiritual war that takes place When you can't see anything around you, but you just feel the tension, the negativity, the opposition is at work. There is that war that you never speak one word, but there's some people that are talking negative about you. And you know this to be true because you just detect something's not right with some people. There's the war that you know about that now somebody wants to get you involved because they are fearful. They don't have the type of faith that you have. Oh, there's some wars ahead. Before the year is out that God has moved you to listen to this message, there is a war ahead. There are those who are literally in military branches and prepping for war. There are mothers and fathers of sons and daughters who are headed to war. Just because for some of you all, it's been a long time since you've been involved in some type of war or know of someone who has been called to war doesn't mean that you're not going to receive some type of trial, some type of uh, fight on your hands. That's why you can't sit too comfortably, right, when you're a believer, because you know that the enemy don't like you. The enemy can't stand you. You talk too much truth or you are spending too much time in the word of God or you're going over to the church and you're getting prayed for. And then you're coming back and sharing the gospel of Christ. The enemy don't like you. So your name is on the list of who he intends to hurt sooner or later. And if you got the wrong folks around you, 
Oh, you best know that those individuals are going to be used by the enemy sooner or later to break you down mentally, physically, spiritually, sexually, and any other way if you show weakness. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 20. For those of you all who have already read at some point in your Bible study time. But we got to go back to Deuteronomy 20. Going to war is the title of that particular passage of scripture. Okay. In my life application, New International Version by Tyndale. Listen to this. When you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots, and for those of you all, you may see some type of dream vision or sign of horses and chariots, but you know it's not horses and chariots that's coming after you, but it's the financial issues. It's the uh, mouth who wants to cuss and fuss and act simple, okay? It's that uh, person who eyeballs you or it's everything breaking down around you in your house, at the workplace, and you're feeling like you're battling someone or something, right? Okay, when you go to war against your enemies and see all of what I mentioned, right? The Bible says horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, right? Oh, there's that group of people that's a part of the social group or the ones who are investors or the board room where there's all of these suits looking at you. And, you know, it appears to be a bit intimidating, right? They're greater than yours. It might be just you and two other people, or maybe just you all alone, or maybe you have a small group, but it's nothing compared to yours. Uh, or compared to those that are in front of you, I should say, right? Okay, here's what the Bible says. Do not be afraid of them because the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt will be with you. When you are about to go in a battle, the priest shall come forward and address the army. He shall say, Hear, O Israel, today you are going into battle against your enemies. Now, for some of you all, you may hear the voice of the Lord, or you may have uh, someone around you who's like a prophet or prophetess or what have you that tells you that there's a battle ahead. There's a fight ahead. You got to get ready. We're going to pray for you. I see this or I see that. And they start giving you words of wisdom, knowledge. And some of you all know the rest, right? So you are told that you're going into battle against your enemies, but the Bible says, do not be faint hearted or afraid. Do not be terrified or give way to panic before them. Some people have panic attacks. Okay. When they are under much stress, I could put my hand up in the past. There was the anxiety issues and it's maybe something that to other people, it's not any big deal. What are you tripping on or what have you? But at times, if the body is not acting in the way that it should act and you're not feeding it and exercising it and doing all the things that doctors have told you, when trial comes, when fights come, you get terrified. You start panicking. You start worrying. You got sweat beads on your forehead, your arms you know, uh, are dripping sweat. Your hands are clammy. Some of you all know. But see, the Bible is there to remind us of what we shouldn't do, right? If I'm a child of God, I need to get some help. I need to make sure that I talk to the Lord about my burdens. And so when the fight comes, I'm not faint hearted or afraid. I'm not panicking, you see. In verse 4 of Deuteronomy 20, it says, For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight. Do you understand that? Some individuals need to be encouraged this day. I know that you can't see the Lord, right? You can't turn to him, give him a hug or, you know, tell him, oh, Lord, can you show yourself uh, and um, fight my battle in the physical sense, like where we could literally see uh, the body of the Lord, right? But the Lord can use people, right? He can use places. He can use things. He can do a great and mighty wonder for you. So it would make sense to pray and ask him to intervene, even though your fleshly self, your carnal self wants God to be something like a human being, right? For the Lord, your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies. And listen to this to give you victory. 
the man or the woman who is on the outside looking in might not see the victory and may even criticize, may even say you should have done this and that and whatever else in the future. Of course, this may not be going on with some of you all right now. There's always that critic that you should have handled it this way and that way. But see, if you get God involved, there are the types of things that take place that even the critic will have to shut up. I have nothing to say. I mean, it is what it is. Yeah, of course, you have nothing to say. See, I brought God into the battle. I could tell you in the past when I was faced up against people bigger, taller, had more of this, that and the other. I brought God in. And when I brought God in, I spoke truth and I hurt their feelings before they could hurt mine. You see, they thought that I was coming one way and God set it up where I was coming in various ways. Lord Jesus, you see, when you confront some folks, there's going to be those. And some of you all need to get my book. Know your enemy, the Christian's critic, as well as face your foe. OK, on confronting the critics. And that's an ebook version uh, right now. It's not in print, but look out for it. It will be. When you are faced with individuals who are going to say any number of things to you, OK, whether they're critical, whether they are so-called flattering you, but then backhanding you with some negativity, they're setting you up for a war. They're setting you up for a war. Now, you got to go to the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, w- what is going on right now? Is this a war? Is this a battle? Is this something that I'm going to have to fight? Sometimes with some of these negative, toxic individuals, it is no real fight at all. You simply walk away because, look, there's a bigger battle that I got to deal with. And you, it's, it's not that serious with you. You can go ahead on. I blow on you and you just, you know, <laughs> blow away. Because sometimes that one who is confronting you and talking smarter, what have you, they're fearful of you. So they're kind of coming up with this this uh, attitude of kill or be killed, right? So they figure you're going to kill them. So they're going to jump on you with the words first, or they know that they've offended you and they know at some point you're going to confront them on it. So they got to come up with something you see. Oh, but our Lord can fight our battles. And if you bring him into uh, whatever it is that you're up against, he's going to give you the victory. You see, Reading on, the officer shall say to the army, has anyone built a new house and not dedicated it? Let him go home or he may die in battle and someone else may dedicate it. Has anyone planted a vineyard and not begun to enjoy it? Let him go home or he may die in battle and someone else enjoy it. You see, now this is just an example of how God will give you instruction. He hasn't changed. He gave people Thousands of years ago instruction and he's still doing this sort of thing. But if I don't spend enough time with the Lord, I'm not going to hear his instruction. If I'm not feeling so loyal to the Lord, um, I don't believe in him, then I'm not going to hear from him. So when you hear individuals who say, well, good luck with that, because uh, God, he don't speak to me or I don't hear him. You definitely don't want to take any type of counsel from them. This is where you've got to spend the time by yourself, behind closed doors, praying, uh, fasting, doing what it takes to prep for the war, for the battle. And he will give you instructions. Um, And sometimes the instructions come through other people because you got so much static and distraction around you. Um, Sometimes the instruction comes from a book. Sometimes the instruction comes from a sign, a wonder, a vision, a dream. Dreams can be very powerful. Sometimes you can't interpret the dream, so you share it with others who can interpret it for you. Okay. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Somebody is probably um, at their wit's end right now because of a battle, you see. And they're at their wit's end because they've been fighting that battle in their own strength rather than bringing God into it. If you claim to be a believer, if that person who you're witnessing going through much claims to be a believer, they shouldn't be faint hearted. They shouldn't be having all sorts of panic. But if they're experiencing all of this, that is because God is not with them. That is evidence, sign, proof, whatever you want to call it, that God is definitely not with that person. OK, so you may have to be the intercessor that prays for that individual who's exhibiting all these signs that they're doing things in their own strength. And anybody who fights a war by his or herself with no God involved, with no support system involved, they usually burn out. And unfortunately, some end up six feet deep in their graves. OK, 
So I hope I'm making it plain for some of you all who are witnessing folks going through and you're saying to yourself, oh, my day is coming. Yes, but look at the mistakes that they make. Look at how they, um, you know, their minds are just not where they should be when it comes to a verbal battle, when it comes to a physical battle. Um, you know, they're just just showing that they are not a people of faith. And sometimes it's through someone else's battle that we find out that a person really isn't who they claim to be. Okay. The battle arises and the man is depressed. He's upset, but you said you're a Christian. So why are you acting up? You're disrespecting your family. You know, you're just running around here doing things that are immoral, unrighteous. You can't be a child of God. I mean, because children of God, they're not going around here acting like that. They are still keeping the faith, even in the storms. You see what I mean? Um, you could be, let's say, going through some things temporarily, still be a child of God, but you're a backsliding Christian. Okay. That's the other point I want to make. Cause I know some individuals will say, well, I know some believers and they, you know, are depressed and sad or what have you, but they're still believers. Okay. All right. But they're backsliding. They're backsliding. They're allowing all of the stuff that's going on around them to dictate, to mandate their emotions. This is why there's doctors. Hello, go to the doctor. Right. Encourage them to go to the doctor and uh, get the necessary uh, help. All right. While you're praying. Hallelujah. And thank you, Jesus. And if you get a believing doctor, a Christian doctor, that's a blessing. All right. So God gives specific instructions and I'm going to skip a bit. Uh, verse seven, has anyone become pledged to a woman and not married her? Let him go home or he may die in battle and someone else marry her. Okay. So one thing about it, we got some folks that's in military branches that are quick to get married. They're quick to get married and then go off into battle. And so now you've hurt, uh, that, that woman because she wants to spend some quality time, right? Um, or women, I should say these men, um, marry, she wants to spend some quality time. She wants the relationship to be nurtured or what have you. She, you know, wants to show how good of a wife she is to the, the, you know, to, to her husband. And then he goes off to battle. And then for some of them, they weren't even married that long. And the man dies. That's disheartening. Put off that, get your career established or what have you. And then when you're ready to leave, then you can be able to devote your time to uh, marriage. But Lord Jesus, we got some individuals that they end up getting married and then they go off cheating because they want that comfort. You see, so that's a battle in and of itself. And then a person's mind can be split in battle. You're bringing a wife or a husband into battle, but then you're emotionally, of course, connected to your husband or wife. And then if something happens to them, this is why the enemy can be able to uh, use husbands and wives in such a way to get at their target, which is that partner, uh, simply by manipulating, brainwashing, what have you. So now there's a war that takes place and it's with the person who's closest to you. It's a strategic move. And many folks who have studied war, they know that in order to bring somebody down, they've got to get to the folks who are closest to them, the ones who they trust. OK, and so sometimes it's not you that knows about the enemy, but your partner, your spouse, the per people who are close to you, they know about the enemy. But some people will reason that, well, I don't want to tell my brother or I don't want to tell my cousin or my aunt or my wife or whoever that so-and-so doesn't like them or hates them or talks a bunch of mess because I don't want them to feel bad or what have you. Wait a minute, hold up. So you want them basically to be backstabbed because sooner or later, that one that's talking crazy is going to come up behind them, right? And hurt them in some kind of way. So you're supposed to alert um, individuals to the enemies that are around them. And if they don't want to believe it, then you can dust your feet off, so to speak, and keep it moving. Look, I'll distance myself because this one's delusional. You see. 
Oh, there's all sorts of battles. There's the battles that's overseas and there's the battles that's right here in the home front. There's the battles where you think that people are your friends when they're really your foe. There's the battles that people claim that we're creating this battle so that we can get some things accomplished that's going to make the world a better place <laughs> only to find out that the world is much worse or the city or the town or the community is much worse because somebody's grandiose idea failed. So going to war can come in all sorts of ways, shapes and sizes. People can be used that you least expect. And it's always best to keep your favorites quiet because there's enemies or people that's working for the enemy that's listening to find out who your favorites are. And if they get to them, they're going to hurt them sooner or later. Um, and then they will in turn hurt you. A lot of stuff involved when it comes to war. Um, moving on in Deuteronomy 20 verse 10, when you march up to attack a city for some of you all, when you go up to somebody's house or go to the workplace to confront someone, hmm, make its people an offer of peace. OK, so you know that there is that one enemy, but he or she got all these people that's around him or her that are supportive of the enemy. The very least you could do is to offer peace, right? Everybody gets an opportunity for peace. But reading on, if they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. Okay, that's how the, it was back in the day. And it still is in some areas, some communities. Verse 12, if they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. Does this make sense for some of you all who watch news unfold internationally? Let's read that again. If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. So I came in peace, right? Let's just use an example. I came in peace. I talked with an individual. I told him about some things that had taken place in the past. Rather than the individual say, I apologize. I made some errors. Please forgive me. The individual wanted to validate the evil, wanted to validate all decisions made, wanted to say that it was OK, it was all right. And then uh, attempted to use someone close to him to do that as well. The, avenger, the uh, individual did to a certain extent, but then offered an apology. OK. So it wasn't the culprit, so to speak, the enemy, but the supportive one said, well, the least that uh, I could do is offer an apology on our behalf. You see, that sort of example, because some of you all may have had, may have had similar ones. That's what keeps at times God's angels from fighting up against that enemy that you may secretly want so bad to bring down is because somebody stood in the gap. Somebody offered peace. Somebody was the intercessor. And that's why the enemy that you want so bad to get paid back for all of the wrong right now is not suffering. Okay. God's people are surrounding that enemy. Or that one who just simply wants to make peace, blessed are the peacemakers, right, is uh, being honored. And that enemy is capitalizing off the blessings in that person's shadow. OK, we have those individuals who look, I know you're upset or she or he is hard to reach right now. But please take my apology. Please forgive. You see. And sometimes that happens peaceably and sometimes there's a fight. Okay. In verse 13, listen to this. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, right? That battle put to the sword all the men in it. That's how deep this thing goes in battle. There are people who get destroyed messing around with God's people. OK, we can sugarcoat. We could cry about. We could say, oh, God, I didn't know it was going to come down like this on my enemy. 
but you brought God into it. And don't think for one minute that God is the kind of God that's just going to sit back and coddle folk, coddle your enemies. This is why I like every now and again looking at this side of the Lord, not just the God of love and joy and peace and mercy and all that, but also the God that's going to fight our battles because it encourages us. It reminds us that God is not a weak God, even though there's people around us who think otherwise or who want to try to manipulate us into thinking that God, oh, he wouldn't do this. He wouldn't do that. And you pray in this prayer or act in this way. Oh, you know, that's not of the Lord. Okay, we're in battle now. Forget all of the sentimentals. We're in battle now. And we want some folks to go down for all of the evil that they've done. Well, how do you know it's evil? I don't need Satan to come into the picture to try to get me to not pray the kind of prayers that I know that my God is moving on me to pray. Well, what about love your enemy? We're in battle now. OK, we don't handhold. We don't hug. All those opportunities came and they went. Now we're in battle, you see. But of course, those who are followers of Satan, they don't want you to know the authority that you have in Christ. They don't want you to know that God is a God that fights battles. They don't want you to be able to speak the kind of things that's going to get some things done. They don't want that. So they're going to try to weaken you. Weaken your faith. They, this is part of the fight. It's part of the battle. <laughs> okay. That's why we don't listen to any and everybody in our ear, especially weak minded, lukewarm believers. No, I want the strong ones. I want the ones that believe in praying Psalms. I want the ones that believe in the God of Deuteronomy as well as Jesus in the New Testament. I want those individuals who believe that the Holy Spirit speaks. And that we do have spiritual gifts. Those are the ones that take God seriously, that take the people of God seriously. But those ones who want to weaken your faith, keep those out of the battle. Okay. Matter of fact, um, if they do want to fight, have them way in the back. They're not frontline fighters, not in the least. So. Verse 14, as for the women, the children, the livestock and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves. So you see, quiet as it's kept, some individuals have won. They've won battles. They've, they have the victory and they have received the assets of the enemy. Okay. They've received the material wealth of the enemy. Some of you all may have been jealous about that. You may have been like, oh, that's a, that's just wrong. We should have got this, that and the other, but you don't know what that person went through. The type of fight um, some people do know. Um, and so if you weren't in the battle, you're not entitled to too much of anything. OK, that's why for some folks, if God is moving you to get on board, um, then get on board because there may be a blessing that's coming right around the corner for you. You've got to show yourself to be loyal. You've got to show yourself not to be the one that's going to run from the fight, be faint hearted, have the panic, be worried, cause all sorts of problems, be used by the devil to weaken one's faith and all that. No, you cannot be that person. And this is why some individuals, they unfortunately don't get um, the blessings at the end of the battle. Matter of fact, they don't even get to so much as walk through the door or be around the victors. OK, because the victors have watched how uh, the weak minded, the lukewarm so-called believers have been during battle. And so, no, we're not rewarding. We're not giving. We're not doing too much of anything. OK. Verse 18, however, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. Once again, this is the loving God, but is also the God that is in war. Right. 17, completely destroy them. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Now, all of these individuals. All of these individuals that were in tribes, they had their share of gods that they worshipped. OK, they were ungodly, unrighteous gods. And because they were worshipping, you know, you these these uh, foreign gods and so forth, strange gods and also, you know, burning strange fire and all that. You, they reaped what they had sown. OK, and some folks even to this day, um, this is why this going back into your family tree, your family history. It's so crucial at times because 
Um, if you're able to go as far back as biblical times, or at least get some type of understanding as to where your people came from, that would also explain why your people are always going through some kind of battle. Okay. Lord Jesus, verse 18, otherwise they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods and you will sin against the Lord your God. So we don't want, of course, to murder folk, kill people in the families and elsewhere. We don't want to do that sort of thing. OK, the Lord, he handles all, all sorts of issues. Right. But what you do want to do is keep your children, grandchildren, what have you away from individuals who are notorious for fighting. OK, just fighting all sorts of battles, but not being victorious. And they're definitely not bringing God into it. So they've got their verbal battles. You don't want your children looking at auntie so and so cussing and fussing or grandma, whoever or grandfather. You don't need them around that. OK, um, you're looking to claim an inheritance. Uh, you want to bring about love and peace and joy to your children, to your grandchildren, great grandchildren, what have you. So. When you got people who are in spiritual warfare and it seems like every time you turn around, there's something going on with them and it's just not righteous, true, what have you, you, you got to know that the demonic is at work. OK, and when they ignore wise counsel and they still want to fight battles in the way that they've always fought them, you don't want to be a part of it because you're not going to come out victorious. OK. You got some people who they do have personality disorders. OK, we have seen this with leadership internationally, nationally. We got folks in our own families, people at the workplaces with some personality disorders. You don't join battle with a person with a personality disorder unless, of course, there are so many people around them that are bullying them, that don't get them, that are just being belligerent, nasty to that person because you're aware that they have a personality disorder and they shouldn't be mistreated or bullied. But when that personality disorder has consumed that person and now they're bullying and they're causing all sorts of conflict or what have you, you've got to establish your boundaries. You've got to protect yourself. And if it means documenting, having meetings, what have you, um, even going so far as to come up with a strategic plan to remove that person out, then that's what you do. Once again, right, it's not always about somebody going upside somebody's head and then lo and behold, if something happens and they end up being killed, now you got blood on your hands. We're not talking about that, but you can distance yourself and you can set things up in such a way to push people out. We cannot have this troublemaking, crazy making, what have you individual in the camp. God is not calling us to do all of these demonic things that this person is saying is okay and all right. This person is bringing the establishment down. What does it take to get this person out? You see, and God will set up all sorts of things if you pray and trust in him. And of course, write down instruction, right? Sometimes things are not going to work during the first battle. Sometimes things are still not going to work the second battle. You may be battling with somebody for weeks, months, or even years. But if that person or group is not right, sooner or later, they're coming down. Okay? They're going down. They're exiting. They're, you know, maybe something unfortunate happens to them and they end up six feet deep in their grave. And there was nothing that you did. But they made enemies. And so the enemies took them out. OK, a lot of times people who are demonic have demonic entities in and around them that will destroy them. That is Satan's ultimate goal. He does not care about his uh, minions. He doesn't care about them. He wants to destroy them. He uses them for a season and then destroys them mentally, physically and spiritually. We see this in the media. A person is used for a time, sold their soul to the devil for a time, right? And then eventually all of what they sacrificed, gave up, eats them up. OK, so going into war is not something that we need to lose sleep about. Knowing that there is going to be trouble ahead is still nothing that we need to be worried about. We have brought God into it in Jesus mighty name. Somebody needs to pray right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, 
I need you to be in this upcoming battle. I don't know the day, the time, the hour, or who is involved, but I know, Lord Jesus, that we will come out victorious. I know, Lord Jesus, that you will give me the instructions to be able to fight up against the enemy who is out to kill, steal, and destroy. Lord Jesus, be with us, Lord. Bring about, Lord Jesus, the sword, the sword, Lord Jesus, that they intend to use on me. In Jesus' name, and whatever that verbal sword or physical sword even might be, just ask that the Lord just move upon you uh, in such a way where you are protected first and foremost, that you will still have love in your heart. Even when others will say, "Uh uh-uh, I would hate him, I would do this and that, that you will still have love in your heart, right? Um. God is just an awesome God. And when he sounds the alarm on what is ahead, we need to take heed and prep ourselves. It could be a financial battle. So, you know, you need to save money, of course. Um, It could be a verbal battle. So, you know, that you want to be able to speak the kind of words that God wants you to speak and also to be quiet when God wants you to be quiet. It may be a physical battle, so it would make sense to be exercising, to, you know, watch your food intake, your portion sizes, um, to join a gym, right? Uh, do some uh, uh, types, participate in the types of training that's going to strengthen your muscles, right? And then if it's one of those knowledge battles, if you will, you, of course, would want to study, Um, not study to the point of exhaustion and stress and crazy stuff, but just study enough each day, 20, 40 minutes, an hour a day, whatever the material. And then when the battle comes, you are prepped. You're ready. Okay. So a lot of battles ahead. May God be with each and every one of you in the network. If you want to reach out to me, by all means, you can do that at Nicole McGuire at gmail.com. If you want to share your victory, you can do that in the comments section. If you like this teaching, by all means, like. And you are also welcome to subscribe to get the latest uploads. And for those individuals who would like to show support, you can do that. There are links in the description box. We do accept tips and thank you in advance. Blessings to you.